Okay, folks, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, good, perfect. Um, I did not get a chance to send you the slides because I just got done, but I'll put the slides and the Excel spreadsheet uh, with um, my Netflix analysis online in, you know, right after this class is over. I can't do it during the class. Um, but um, don't worry about not getting the slides. So when you look at the slides, you say, oh, where are the slides? They, they will be downloadable in about an hour and a half. That's the first thing. And I, and I want to emphasize the word that the spreadsheet I'm going to put up is my Netflix analysis. It's not the Netflix analysis. And you're going to see very quickly why I make that statement, because even though the case seemed to be pretty explicit about what I wanted you to use as the facts, there were things on which I gave you room to make assumptions, which means that those assumptions can cause numbers to be different. So as I go along, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to present my numbers, my analysis, my conclusion, but I'm also going to show you what you found as groups. And that's why I wanted the, the summary sheets. I got about 45, which is pretty close to what I think the number of groups in this class will be. I think it's about 50. So thank you for sending those in. I'll show you your summaries and you might be surprised or you might not and how, how much divergence there is in the numbers. Now, not all the divergence is because of difference in assumptions. Some of you probably screwed up and added a zero where there shouldn't be. It can happen, you know, when you have Excel spreadsheets. So we'll talk about explainable divergences and unexplainable divergences as we go along. So here's what I want you to do. As I present my numbers, don't freak out. So when I say my net present value is 413 million, don't say, oh my God, we got 1,055, all is lost. I am looking at the process by which you're doing the case. This is not a multiple choice. We got the answer, you did not. So there are going to be things where there are places where you will disagree with me. So this is a good place to actually kind of get your basics of not just capital budgeting, but evaluation nailed down. So as we go through, make me go through stuff that you don't quite understand. So draw, you know, make me stop and go through things, especially if you feel that it's not clear. Okay, so let's get started. So in this case, basically what I gave you was a set of facts about Netflix fit. And you can obviously see what the Netflix fit idea was born out of. It's out of the success of Peloton, basically, because of Peloton, of course, went public, it was a public, it went public last year. And Peloton's business model is very simple. It sells equipment, you know, originally only exercise bikes, but now bikes and treadmills at a pretty high price, $2,500 for a bike, $4,000 for a treadmill. 
but the revenues from the equipment itself is only a slice of the total revenues. Once you get the equipment, you also subscribe to a Peloton app, which gives you live uh, fitness programs. So basically you can take the Peloton app and that, that's $40 a month. $40 for a subscription is pretty hefty if you think about it because you know you pay 16 I pay $16 for a Netflix family subscription which allows what four or five streams $40 for a Peloton subscription so it's an upscale it goes after a market and it went public and it's a pretty successful company in terms of getting subscribers and revenue so I structured this case around the Peloton case now incidentally one of the things you always have to deal with when you do valuation and capital budgeting is life happens in continuous time what i mean by that is you don't get revenues at a point in time you get them over the course of a year your expenses are over the course of a year and it's a pain in the neck to be dealing with things over the course of a year so that's why i had to go to fairly meticulous lengths to tell you what year one was year two was so here's the way to think about time we live we use a discrete time analysis not because we're being unrealistic but because it makes our life simpler so time zero is not a year, it's a point in time. Year one is the end of 365 days from now. So you almost have to work in that world. So year one is one year out, year two is two years out, year 10 is 10 years out. And so that's going to kind of affect the way we do things. On top of this, to add to the complication, accounting works on its own timetable, right? So even if accounting has a calendar year end, the numbers don't come out till probably February, March. So even if your year end is December 31st. So what I'm trying to say is when I say year one earnings, year one cash flows, I want you to be clear about what I'm saying. I'm saying these are the numbers I'm going to get over the course of the next year. I'm going to act like I get them at the end of the year. Now, I know some people try to play games with it and use media conventions. I don't have the time for that. It's really not worth the effort. So it's a, it's a simplification. I agree with that. All your payments happen over time. I'm just assuming they happen at a point in time. So with that set up, let me give you my bottom line conclusions. And here's where you're going to start to free card. You're going to say those numbers look nothing like mine. I'll explain how I came up with my numbers and I'll be very clear. These are my numbers, my assumptions, my conclusion. They don't have to be your numbers, your assumptions, your conclusion. On a standalone project, on a standalone basis, this is this project is value adding in the finite life, but only marginally and with synergy benefits counted in, it does look good. So let me explain. Now, I, I went through the same process I asked you to go through. I computed a return on capital. The return on, cap on capital I got for this project was about 10.45% without synergy counted in. You know the synergy I'm talking about, it's a Netflix entertainment. Get side benefits because of Netflix fit. Without the synergy, the return on capital I get is 10.45%. With synergy, it's 13.44%. I know many of you got returns on capital much higher. I'll tell you why that might be happening, but we'll come. I'll, I'll show you the numbers in, in a couple of minutes. The net present value that I got for this project and my cost of capital for Netflix fit was 7.97%. Was 121 million in the finite life case, the 10 year life. And with the side benefits from Synergy added on, the net present value I got was about half a billion, 498 million. So that's the, the, that, that was my finite life net present value. For the, for the longer life, notice I did not say perpetual life in the case, I just said longer life, which means you had the option of going forever. You can go for 10 extra years, 15 extra years. I didn't say anything about growth. You could reduce the cash flow. So basically, one reason for difference is what you assume happens after year 10. I'll tell you what I assume. I did assume an infinite life, but with no growth in subscribers. You're going to see exactly what this means when I get to the calculation. The net present value I got with the perpetual life was 433 million. If you compare the two net present values, notice by going from a finite life to a perpetual life, I add only 320 million to my net present value. For many of you, that difference between the two cases was much larger. And I'll talk about why that might be happening and what you have to be careful about. But that was my net present value in the longer life. With the synergy benefits added in there, I got a net present value of 1.15 billion. The internal rates of return I got reflected what I found my net present value. They were higher than my cost of capital, again, not by huge amounts. In the finite life case, I get about 8.74%. And even in the longer life case, I earn about 1% more than my cost of capital, the 10-year life, and a little bit more if I add the longer life. 
all of the numbers in this case, and this is something that some of you caught on to very quickly when you read the case, especially if you come from this background of user subscriber basis, are built around the assumption of almost 100% renewal. What does that mean? When I sign up subscribers in year zero, I'm assuming at the end of year five, they're going to renew and renew and renew because if you don't have 100% renewal, your cash flows start to look a lot worse. One reason I can justify this is Netflix's renewal rate is about 96 to 97%. Peloton is a very high renewal rate as well. But the lower this renewal rate becomes, the less attractive the project becomes. And that worries me a little bit. The other is the fact that this is a technology-based business worries me as well. Why? Because technology comes with a finite life. Even the best technologies fade over time. So that perpetual life assumption, I might be asking for too much. I would recommend, if I were asked, that Netflix leave this business alone, leave it to Peloton, let them play this game. Because I don't think there's enough value added in this business, even with that positive net present value to go in. If Netflix were a more mature company where they did not have other investments, I might not be as willing to do this. But given that Netflix has other fish to fry, their basic content business is not that healthy yet. They want to make that healthier. I would say hold back. Doesn't mean they will never accept. Remember, the accept reject is not permanent. Doesn't mean they can't come back three years later and figure out a better way. But unless they can find a way to keep the renewal rates really high and get more side benefits, my suggestion is to reject. So positive net present values, IRR greater than the cost of capital, return on capital greater than the cost of capital. But I'm still holding back on accepting the investment. So somebody has their mic unmuted. Madison, can you, uh, do you have a question or is your mic just unmuted? Okay, thank you. Okay. So let me go through my calculations. I'm gonna start with my cost of capital calculation so you can see what I'm trying to do. I actually computed two costs of capital, one for, for Netflix Fit and one for Netflix Entertainment. You're gonna see why I need two costs of capital. To compute the net cost of capital for Netflix Fit, I used only the fitness companies and I stayed with just with median numbers. I used the median regression beta across the companies that I sent you and the median debt to equity ratio to come up with an unlevered beta for fitness companies, 0.99. I looked at the median cash as a person of firm value, which is 5.26% to come up with the median unlevered beta. 1.0495 is my median unlevered beta. So that is the unlevered beta for being in the fitness business. That is what I'm going to use as my unlevered beta for Netflix fit. Why? Because remember what we talked about. When you look at a project, it's a project's risk that drives how you assess that project, not the company. So the fact that I have a, a cost of cap for Netflix overall is kind of irrelevant. Don't take weighted averages. Don't bring anything to do with Netflix into your cost of capital. I'm just going to use that unlevered beta. To get my debt to equity ratio, I used the fact in the case that I said that they would use the same debt to equity ratio for this project as they did on the rest of Netflix. So I looked at the, the debt to equity ratio for Netflix as a company. The market value of equity when I did this assessment was 163 billion. The market value of debt includes two components. One is the interest bearing debt, which I got to be 15.44 billion, and the present value of leases, 1,767 million. I did convert the book debt into market debt, but if you don't do that, it's not a big deal. I get 17.2 billion. One reason we can get mild difference in the cost of capital is depends on how the debt is converted. Okay? So the debt ratio that I end up with is about 10.6%, debt, debt to equity ratio is about 10.6%, the debt to cap ratio is 9.6%. Let me pause right there. Are there any questions so far about why I'm using Netflix Fit and why I'm using Netflix Fit, un, the unlevered beta of the fitness companies and the debt to cap ratio of Netflix? So what I'm looking for in your analysis is don't, you don't want to use book equity ever. You don't want to load up everything on the balance sheet as debt ever. So you don't want to include things like all liabilities. So the the levered beta that I get for Netflix fit is 1.13. And that levered beta, if you bring in the risk-free rate, which is 1.5% when this case was written, 
and the equity risk premium based on where Netflix fit is going to get its subscribers. We're sticking with that same principle. Tell me where your business is and I'll tell you what your equity risk premium should be. It gives me a cost of equity of 8.58%. For the cost of debt, I use the fact that your default spread is given. No. Um, and was the default spread 2% or 1.5%? I, I, I don't even remember. So if it was 2%. Okay, then this is the, then my cost of capital should be is should be higher. So basically, for whatever reason, I built in one point five percent into my Excel spreadsheet. It'll make my cost of capital slightly higher, not by much. It'll be like eight point oh three percent or something because they have relatively little debt. But the cost of capital that I end up with reflects the after tax cost of debt, twenty five percent tax rate being the marginal tax rate gives me a cost of capital of about 8% for Netflix fit and slightly higher for Netflix entertainment because I asked you to use the beta for the company, the 1.29 beta. So I have two costs of capital here, right? One for Netflix fit, about 8%, and one for Netflix entertainment, 8 point, I think it's 8.88%. I can't see the number in my sheet. Uh, it's 8.88%. Now you're saying, why do you need both costs of capital? You know why I need two, two costs of capital? If you didn't do this, not a big deal yet because it, it, there were two slices of cash flows in the project, right? One from Netflix Fit and one for the synergy benefit creates for Netflix Entertainment. In this case, those synergy benefits were so small that if you bundled them in and use the Netflix Fit cost of capital, I'm going to say that's okay. But if your synergy benefits to the other business were large enough, the right thing to do is to discount those benefits at the 8.88% cost of capital. It's that principle again, you discount cash flows, the risk of the business creating the cash flows. So that's why I've computed two costs of capital. Any question about the cost of capital? So I'll have to fix the 3%, I'll fix it and then repost it, but it's not going to change my, my cost of capital or my net present value by very much. No questions so far? Go ahead. Yes. So, but, sorry, just one clarification. Yeah. Um, what's, what's the 6.27% again? That's my weighted average of the equity risk premiums of the, I told you where Netflix outfit is going to get its subscribers. It's a weighted average of the parts of the world where they get their revenues. All oh, right, thank okay. you. So let me show you what you found. So this will make you feel a lot better if you got a number different from mine. No two, I, I don't think there were more than, I think 8.01%, two or three P, uh, I think 8.01% might have been the only number where more than one group got the same number. This is your distribution of cost of capital that you found. There were two groups that found cost of capital less than 6%. I don't I, I can't think of what you could have assumed that's within the reasonable bounds that could have got you there. Something's, something's gone off kilter if you got less than 6%. There were about four groups, three groups that got more than 9%. Again, I find it difficult to get to more than 9%, but I'll check your numbers. Obviously, I haven't read your cases yet. 8 to 8.5% 8 is where most of you ended up. That was the, the middle of the distribution, and that doesn't surprise me. As I said, there can be mild differences in how you capitalize leases and what you included in debt. So the cost of capital for this project is about 8 to 8.5%. 8 I think that makes sense. So you can see that the middle of the distribution is there. For those of you who got higher cost of capital, it is possible you, you try to do some kind of weighted average of Netflix and Netflix fit. Don't do that when you do a project. A project is supposed to be a project. Just take the project, its cash flows, discount back at the project's cost of capital. And you get side benefits discounted back separately at the cost of capital for Netflix entertainment. Okay. So that's a distribution of cost of capital. Any questions before we dive into the into the earnings and cash flows? Chad, you have a question? Yeah. Go um, ahead. So why is it that we use the overall Netflix debt to equity ratio instead of using the projects um, debt to equity ratio when we levered the beta? What did I even give you information? I, I told you the project would be funded the same way as a company. So where would you get a project debt to equity ratio? Uh, right. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. And even if you knew how the project was funded, be very careful because project funding is kind of arbitrary. Let me explain. Let's suppose I told you I funded this project entirely with debt. Would you use a 100% debt ratio in your cost of capital calculation? Think of 
how much benefit it'll, it'll give the project if I use 100% debt ratio, your cost of capital is going to be like 2.25%. You're going to be taking project after project to fund with debt. But remember, projects funded with debt basically mean other projects have to be funded with equity. So unless you have a standalone project, a big infrastructure project that can carry its own debt, it's always better to step away from the project financing, even if you know it, because projects don't have the capacity to borrow money. The company borrows money and you want to think about the company's debt capacity. Perry? On that. Yeah. What if the only asset securing that debt is the project? That's why I said it has to be a standard. You almost never get that with projects like these, Netflix projects. is You know when you get that? A big infrastructure company will have an infrastructure project. That infrastructure project has to be carved out in such a way that it it is a standalone project. That's what I meant by standalone projects. Most 99% of projects won't fit that characteristic. But if you're in a business where you do big infrastructure projects that can carry their own debt, then you can use the project's debt ratio. Uh, Okay, you ready? Let's move on. Let's now look at operating income and incremental operating income. So basically what I did was I created two income statements. Why? Because I, I think it's a pain in the neck to add back, uh, you know, portions of GNA you shouldn't have subtracted out. But I did it that way at first to begin with. So I start with revenues and my revenues come from two places. One is equipment sales and the other subscription revenues. Initially, the equipment sales are the bigger chunk. And as I mature as a project, the subscription revenues take over, which is not atypical for these projects. So I get revenues from equipment and subscription. I subtract out the costs associated with the equipment. I think it's 40% of whatever the equipment revenue is. And the servicing costs for the subscription, which is 20% of whatever my subscription revenues. Then I subtract content costs. Basically, you see that was given in the case, 400 million year one growing at 10%. Then I subtract depreciation. And in my finite life case, that depreciation is whatever my initial investment was. I think it was 2 billion depreciated over time, down to a salvage value of 400 million. Then there's SGNA, S selling and advertising and allocated GNA. So in the original analysis, I said 5% of the GNA is allocated. So I subtracted that or whatever that percentage was. So that's my operating income. And in my first year, I lose money. The incremental operating income is not that different. All I did in the incremental operating income is I replaced the allocated GNA with the incremental GNA. So why go through this contortion? So the incremental operating income and the operating income are very close, but you can see you lose money up front on this project. And then as the project builds up, you make money. No surprises there. But if you take that incremental operating income and you divide it by the invested capital, and to get the invested capital, I added the book value of the fixed assets, which you can see decline over time. And I add to that the book value of working capital. Working capital is accounts receivable plus inventory minus accounts payable. So if you, if you look at the facts in the case, it's 4% plus 3% minus 2% works out like 5% of, of, of revenues. So basically you can see uh, the working capital increases over time with my revenues. And I, my book value of the Netflix studio is basically whatever I'm going to invest in it. So that 520.3 million and in year zero, year one should even show up there. But basically that's my invested capital. So we'll talk about the book value, the, the studio and what I'm, what I, what I, what I include in there. But if you divide the after tax operating income by my invested capital, I get a return on capital. And as with the operating income, my return on capital up front is negative. And as I build through time, my return on capital builds up with it as well. So what I have here is a re an accounting return and my accounting return on capital is low up front and rises over time in my finite life case. The reason is my the reason it rises so much is as I go through time, my assets get depreciated down to lower and lower numbers. So this is almost a feature of any finite life project is accounting return is going to climb over time, often to very, very high numbers by the time I get to your nine or ten. One problem is just averaging return on capital. A simple average is those ending numbers are going to kind of push your average up. So what I did to compute my return on capital on the project is I added up the operating income over the next 10 years. 
Think of it as the sum of the and divided by the sum of the invested capital over the next 10 years. And my return on invested capital, the 10.45% that you saw, reflects this, the aggregated number. So it's kind of a weight, think of it as a weighted average of the next 10 years. So that's why my number is lower. If I'd taken a simple average, my return on capital would have been higher than 20%, which is what many of you found. And that's not uncommon. Now, one of the things you will notice is this return on capital is a function of judgment calls you have to make. I know many of you email me asking, how much of the studio should I allocate to this project? You know, should I allocate 30%? Should I allocate 50%? And I took the entire studio and put it in there, but you know what? You could have put 30% of the existing studio, 50%. And I didn't push back. I said, make an allocation judgment and move on. Some of you asked about capitalizing content costs, which is perfectly appropriate. If you did that, you'd get a different return on capital, a much lower return on capital. The reason I did not push back is because I knew you were not going to base your decision on return on capital. Here's something to remember. If you're not going to base your decision on a decision rule, you don't want to spend too much time on it. That's why accounting judgments, in my view, I mean, you want to make a judgment and move on because deciding whether you want to use an accelerated or a straight line depreciation, unless it affects your taxes, which it could, it really is not worth the effort. Just make a judgment and move on unless you plan to make your entire decision on accounting return on capital. So if I paused right there and I said, let me show you my return on capital. Based on return on capital, this project looks good. But remember what we said with Disney? Return on capital is a flawed measure. It's based on accounting earnings. It's not time-weighted. It's not incremental. But at least it's a starting point. And at least on the starting point, the project passes muster, but again, not by a huge amount, 10.45% without synergy counted in, by 13% with synergy counted in. Any questions on accounting returns? Uh, Yun asked, why don't we make additional fixed capital investments? I'm going to come back to this. What, as I describe the return on capital, remember I kept describing it as my return on capital in my finite life. I asked you to do two, two analyses, one with a 10-year life and one with a longer life. These are not scenarios. These are two different ways of running the project. When I'm running it for a 10-year life, you know what I'm doing? I'm treating it as a 10-year project. I'm not throwing additional money into this project as it ages. Why? Because at the end of 10 years, I know I'm going to shut the project down. When I do my longer life, I'm going to make sure that I invest as if I'm going to have a longer life. This is one place where I, it's not going to be a big deal. I'm not going to take off five points, it, but it's going to be a point that I almost obsess over because to me, this is a central point in both capital budgeting and valuation. How much you put back into a project, how much you reinvest in a project has to be a function of whether you want to run this project for just five years or 50 years. So in this particular scenario, there is no additional capital expenditure. I make my upfront investment and I'm going to ride that investment out for the next 10 years. I'm going to liquidate the investment at the end of 10 years. So when I do my cash flows, you're going to see me liquidate everything at the end of every year 10. So I'm going to come back and talk about that assumption because to me, that's a critical part of what I hope you will take out of this case. Okay. So let's see what you found on your return on capital. You got this U-shaped distribution. Don't ask me why. There were about nine groups that got a return on capital less than 5%, which means, and I'll make a guess, it's probably because you have big capital expenditures like Yung Kyung is suggesting, Yung Kyung is suggesting, even in the finite life case. So if I invested huge amounts in CapEx for the next 10 years, my return on capital is going to drop like a rock. So maybe that's why your return on capital is less than 5%. Again, as I said, I haven't read the cases. And at the other extreme, many of you have returns on capital greater than 20%. That doesn't surprise me at all, because as I said, if you take a simple average of the return on capital over the next 10 years, you're going to end up with a really high return on capital. So looking across, if I if you ask me for a middle of the distribution, I couldn't even tell you, probably 12, 12 to 12.5 to 15% is where you ended up, which is close to where I ended up. So maybe there's a crowd return on capital, a kind of average across the group, which is around 12 to 15%, but that's the accounting return on capital. Now let's look at what I'm gonna do when I do my cash flows. When I did my finite life case, 
and that there was a studio investment, right? So I'm going to start spend some time on that studio investment. Remember when we said, talked about incremental cash flows? I said there are two questions you need to ask. What do I need to do if I take this project? What will happen if I don't take the project? And I said the difference is your incremental effect. Let's take the studio. Right, right now you use 40% of the studio. What will happen if you don't take this project? Anybody? What's going to happen with that studio? It's going to be used by Asian content. And what's happening with Asian content? Five years. Otherwise, you'll have to get a new one. No, no, let's not do it. Let's not even bring in the other ones. So basically, if I did not take this project, Asian content is going to keep growing at 20% a year. And I think in about year eight, I'd have run out of studio space anyway, right? And that's what I got. So basically, it's 40, 48, 57.6. So basically, if you put 20% increase every year, I'd have run out of studio space in year seven or year eight, depending on how and what you started with. So if I don't take this project, I'd have run out of studio space in year eight. I'd have built a new studio in year seven. Okay, file that away. If I take this project, what happens? I take 30% of that 60% that I had as excess capacity. I'm going to use it for fitness content and that 30% is now getting it locked up which means that when Asian content takes more studio space I'm now going to run out of studio space in year five so I got year five as the year that I'd run out of studio space with Netflix fit and year eight as the year that I would run out of studio space without Netflix fit do you see where I'm going what's the incremental effect of taking this project it's not just that I'm going to build a studio in year five. That if all you do is count in the 520 million you got to spend in year, f I, um, I assumed you'd have to invest at the start of the previous year, but if you put in year five, that's fine. If, if all you do is put in a minus 520 million in year five or year four for this project, and that's all you consider, I don't think that's fair to the project. And here's why the incremental effect of this project is I'm moving my studio investment up by three years, not just making a studio investment. So I know this is going to sound like a contortion, but it is at the essence of incremental cash flows. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show an investment of 520 million in year four. That's a new studio I'm building because of Netflix Fed. But I'm also going to show the 541 million I'm going to save in year seven because I built the studio in year five. So you're going to see minus 520 in year five, four and plus 541 million in year seven. It's that present value effect of investing earlier rather than later. That is my incremental effect. I, 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 did, I did tie up the loose ends because I treated these as capital investments. If I invest earlier, I get depreciation in years you know, five to eight, which, are, which is incremental depreciation. So I, in the loose ends, if you did not do depreciation, you, you know, it's not a big deal. So, but I just tied up the loose ends. So the key here is, you know, it's a, it takes 15 years, so it should be 10 years. Because I am investing earlier rather than later. I'm going to show the investment in year four, but I'm also going to show, show the savings in year seven. And because I'm wrapping up the project at the end of year 10, there is no capital maintenance and I'm going to get a salvage of both my working capital. Don't forget it and just leave it behind. And my studio, the 400 million at the end of year 10. He's saying, why should I assume that I'll get the studio back? Because it's the easiest assumption to make. So if you assume zero salvage in the studio, that's fine, but then you get a capital loss and tax savings. I don't want to deal with that. The simplest assumption often to make with salvage value is to set it equal to book value. So in my finite life, here's what you would see. Minus 520.3. So that's the capital expenditure in year four because I'm building a new studio. There's the savings in year, in year eight because I, you know, I'm holding off on the, on, on the old studio. There's the, sa the depreciation savings that I'm getting because I'm building earlier. But after year, year eight, those savings kind of dissipate. So essentially what you see here is my investment up front, the savings on a new studio later, and that's what's showing up in my cash flows. If all you do is show them my 520 million, you, you've told me half the story. You haven't told me the other half of the story, and that's basically what I'm reflecting here. When you say, why should Netflix fit pay? Netflix fit pays for nothing. Netflix pays for everything. These are incremental cash flows to the company. 
So don't think of Netflix as a standalone business. It's not. So it's not a question. You're thinking like an accountant when you think about Netflix Fit and Netflix Entertainment as two businesses. Netflix is the company. There are only one company, one set of shareholders. These are incremental cash flows to Netflix from Netflix Fit. That's a way to think about incremental cash flows. So let me pause there because I know this is something that many of you probably did not do or did in a different way. You know, so basically all I'm, the only effect I'm leaving is the present value difference. It's almost like allocation from a time value perspective, right? Because if you think about the difference in present values between 520 million spent earlier and 541 million spent later, it's about 70 or 80 million. I'm punishing this project for that differential value because I think that's a fair thing to do. Any questions? Yes. Uh, on the um, on ROIC, because um, of depreciation, it looks quite high at the end. Would it be reasonable to not depreciate the PPE for ROIC calculation? You can't do that. If you go the accounting road, you've got to follow the accounting road. So if you don't like to do it, just don't use ROIC. Mm. Okay. Right? That's unfortunately a feature of any finite project. I mean, often when you look at retail companies, when they look look at old stores versus new stores, you know what they find? Find if on an accounting return basis, your old stores look amazing. Why? Because you've depreciated everything down to zero. So it's a feature of accounting returns. Not yeah, much you can really do. Misleading in my, in, my yeah, in fact, it's it's often a problem when you compare older companies to younger companies within peer groups. Older companies often look better than they really are because their return on invested capital reflects a depreciated book value. Mm. on their assets. Okay. Any other questions? I think there is still a difference on the assumption for cash flow. I put it in the chat and a lot of groups had agreed. We, will we get back to that at a later stage? Uh, I'm sorry, difference in what? So the assumption of revenue is that because we are assuming that the number of total subscribers will be given as per the case, yeah. if you assume like there's a 20% or a 10% drop rate. Then it gets much, much worse. In fact, I'll save you the trouble. If you if your renewal rate, I'm sorry, you'll get much lower revenues. No, 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 no. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people agree, so I'm, I'm, I'm coming out with this. If your total number of subscribers in year one is 1 million and in year two it's 2 million, and you're assuming a drop rate of, let us say, hypothetically 20%. Oh, I see. And, and you're adding in... 1.2 million for the bike, so you have more revenue. Okay. So, I, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying. If you keep the... To I think six or seven groups have done that. Yeah. I think one reason you can get really high revenues is if you keep the total subscribers fixed and you let the renewal rate drop, you're that, going to get the best of all worlds, right? right? Okay. That's I, like 20 okay, maybe that's... Or... The 20% the ROIC doesn't surprise me. The $10 billion net present value does. So th that's what I'm going to be watching for. If you assume that that's perfectly okay. So if you say I'm assuming a 90% renewal rate, but the total number of subscribers, I'm going to assume the case is right. Then you get the best of both, both worlds because you can keep getting these new subscribers coming in to buy a new bike, which is expensive. So I understand why it might give you a higher cash flow. That's perfectly okay. If, you, if that's what you did and that's why you end up with a higher accounting return and a higher net present value, you're assuming a much more lucrative project and you should get a higher net present value. So I'm okay with that. Yeah. Any other questions? Now the side benefits here are very simple. Because Netflix Fed draws in more subscription revenues for the entertainment business, I tell it's a half a billion in year one growing at the inflation rate after that. I take the pre-tax operating margin times that number. I get 75 million in operating income in year one. And I take the after-tax amount. So here the, the synergy is a very simple number to calculate. It's a present value of that after-tax operating income because after-tax operating income is also going to be cash flows. It's pure gravy for entertainment. So the synergy benefits are basically the after-tax operating income to the entertainment business. Okay? So I'm ready to do my NPV. So here's what I did. I took uh, the finite life cash flows, which I already showed you, and notice that there's a drop in year four. There's a negative cash flow. Remember what we said about uh, multiple internal rates of return? At least in theory, there's a second internal rate of return here. 
which might be so outlandish you never get there, but there's a negative cash flow in year four. The jump in your rate is because I get the savings from that other studio. I take the present value of the 7.97% cost of capital. I get an NPV of 121 million. For the incremental after-tax operating income, I take the incremental operating income discount back at the 8.88% entertainment cost of capital. It's not a big deal here if you use the 8%, as I said, I'm not even going to, you know, that's that's perfectly okay, but it's, it's always a good idea to separate the two cash flows. I get an NPV in my finite life case with the synergy included of 498 million. Any, any questions on the finite life case? So the finite life case, right from day one, I'm, I'm acting as if I'm going to run this project for 10 years. That's it. So everything I do for the next 10 years is driven by the choice I made up front. Now I'm going to switch gears and say, look, I want to run this project as if it's a long term project. You're going to see everything I do is going to be different when I make that assumption. Now, incidentally, the net present values you got and maybe Perry's uh, explanation could explain this. You know, there are quite a few groups, in fact, 13 groups which had net present values of over a billion on the finite life case. The median was somewhere around, you know, to, around my numbers. The median numbers actually match up to my numbers, but there's a huge amount of divergence. There are quite a few of you with negative net present values in the finite life case. I'll guess that's because you put in a lot of capital maintenance and kill the project after year 10 which is a little unfair because you're making this the project, you're making people the people running this project invest in this project as if it's a long-term project and showing up magically at the end of your 10 and saying, sorry guys, we've changed our mind. Life, the life of a project is not a probabilistic idea. It's something that comes as a choice up front. So that might be why your net present values are so much more negative than mine. Now let's talk about the, the infinite life case. As I said, it doesn't have to be infinite life. You could have used 15 extra years, 20 extra years. I'm perfectly okay with that. But I did make some assumptions in the longer life case where I said, look, right from day zero, I'm going to do things differently. The first thing I'm going to do is every year, I'm going to put money into capital maintenance. And one of the questions I think many of you struggled with is how do we decide how much capital maintenance is the right amount? You know what I tied it to? depreciation because at least in theory what does depreciation measure it measures the depletion in my assets right i know it's accounting it's not economic but here's what i do for the first 10 years whatever i get as cash flows from depreciation i'm putting back into the project so essentially i am putting back with inflation so as i go through time the capex is going to get higher and in year 11, when I do forever, I want to make sure that I keep replacing assets forever. Otherwise, I'll have nothing to depreciate. So basically, the big change here is I'm now going to introduce a capital maintenance expenditure, which is going to be higher than my depreciation every year for the next 10 years and in perpetuity. I'm also going to assume the synergy benefits continue in perpetuity as well. So here's what I get. For my cash flows, here's the big difference. You will now see a maintenance capex show up every year for the next 10 years. So that's just going to be whatever my capex is. So in years, year one, it said 1% it said higher. In year two, it's 1% compounded for two years. So basically, that's why the capital maintenance gets higher and higher. And in year 11, it's actually significantly higher than my depreciation because now you're looking at a 10-year compounded inflation effect. So what it does is it lowers my free cash flow every year for the next 10 years. But what do I get in return? I get a cash flow that continues forever. And that cash flow is basically what's going to give me my terminal value. So the big difference between my finite life and my perpetual life is essentially coming from what happens after year 10. And I'm going to assume that after year 10, the number of subscribers levels off. You know why I did this? Because otherwise I've got to deal with the, with the growth problem. If I let the number of subscribers grow out after year 10, that studio is not going to be enough. I've got to think about new studios to build. This way, it's locked in at 30%. Anything that happens after year 10, you can't blame Netflix fit for it. It allows me to tie up loose sets. So any growth rate higher than the inflation rate, you know, you're going to end up with issues on how much to invest. So that 258 million in year 11 that you get as cash flows drops off from year 10 because I no longer have new people signing up.
Incidentally, that's going to be different if you're assuming a renewal rate and a growth rate because then you're going to have new subscribers, new equipment, new investments you need to make. You'll have to deal with it because that's what I basically end up with a value of 3.7 billion as my terminal value. So what I'm doing is I'm replacing the salvage value with the terminal value. And the best way to understand what happens when I go from a finite life to a longer life is to think about the difference in cash flows. So here's what I trade off. When I run the project as a 10 year project, I collect more cash flows over the next 10 years, but I get a much lower salvage value. If I decide to go to a longer life, I have to get less cash flows for the next 10 years because I put money back into the project, but I get a higher terminal value. You cannot keep your cash flows fixed and just put in a terminal value because you're being unfair to one, one potential choice or the other. So that's something I want you to think about whenever you do both capital budgeting and valuation is you can't just get to a year five or year 10. So let me just make it a terminal value because it's not a choice you make at that point in time. It's a choice you make earlier. So that's why my net present value is more muted than many of your net present values is I have much lower cash flows for the next 10 years. And my net present value reflects that additional capex. Even with the additional capex, I do get a higher net present value with a longer life. 452 million and with the synergy benefits, but synergy benefits also increase because they're a perpetuity of 713 billion. Now we're talking about a fairly significant net present value, about 1.1, maybe 1.2 billion in sum. But the key thing that I want you to think about is that capital maintenance assumption. So let's summarize. If the project ends, again, the 15 replaced with 10. If the project ends, there's no a very low capital maintenance. So here's what I, I'm okay with. If you put in capital maintenance, even with a finite life case, so you can never have zero, but you put in much lower capital maintenance than in the, than the longer life, I'm, I'm completely there with your logic. If you put in a growth rate of zero, then you can set capital maintenance equal to depreciation because you're not even growing at the inflation rate. You're actually shrinking. If you get the growth rate at the inflation rate, your capital maintenance has to be higher than depreciation. And if you put a growth higher than inflation, then you got to build more equipment, more studios, your reinvestment has to be even higher. So you need to tie your growth assumption after your 10 to whatever your capital maintenance assumptions are, because that's the way the world works. You can't just keep everything fixed and just change the growth rate. So your findings on perpetual life were all over the place. There's no peak to this distribution. It's, I'm just, I, I'm interested to see why your numbers are so diverse because there are people who get negative net present values, minus 500 million or less, even with the perpetual life. And I'm interested to see why that's happening. The other extreme, there are people who are getting 10 billion or higher, and that seems like a high number. Maybe it's a renewal rate assumption, but there's no, there's no consensus in this class on the perpetual life net present value. So in summary, here's what you found. As I said, there were 45 groups that turned in the numbers. 28 suggested that the investment should be made. 17 said it should not be made. So more people thought the investment should be made than should not, which doesn't surprise me given the kind of consensus net present value. But here's what I'd like you to think about. Let's suppose you'd actually made this investment, you know, eight weeks ago. 10 weeks ago before the crisis. If you accept it, it's 10 weeks later, right? So you're saying, what can change in 10 weeks? Come on, after the last 10 weeks. So if you were one of those groups that accepted the project 10 weeks ago, or six weeks ago even, before February 14th, would you now look back and say, I wish I had not done this? Would you, could you, would you, be, would you change your mind now? Anybody? And obviously the risk-free rate has dropped, the equity risk premiums have gone up, the world has shifted around you. You more reluctant or less? Anybody, go ahead. Perry, go ahead. I would, I, I'm thinking of two impacts. The first, so, so we had accepted it. Yeah. My first impact is that yes, people's buying power is reduced. Yeah. Uh, and I, I was actually targeting this product, the middle or above the middle, the, the startup. Mm -hmm. So they want to work out more at home. And now they've seen the, the like, I know people in class who are not sad because they can't right. go to the gym. And they're like, I want one option at home so that I can do this. So maybe I'm not so sad. And and I think this is the argument that's because playing. The market, yeah, go ahead. The target market for this product yeah. is not that sensitive. 
sensitive to one or two month closure from an economic or out of the pocket perspective, it's more safe to not being open, able to go to the gym. As long as you do not face a capital issue as Netflix. Remember, you have to add that qualifier, right? I don't know how much trouble Netflix is in because Netflix is a cash burning machine, right? You know, so as long as you are not in trouble as a company, I agree with you. I think actually the last six weeks might have actually made your case stronger because there's going to be no new startup coming doing this for the next two years because VC money is going to dry up. And you're right, this might change people's behavior. More people might exercise at home now than did before. So I think that you're right with that qualifier, which is you have to be healthy enough that you can think long term. Eric brings up Tiger King. You know what? Netflix spent the money on Tiger King a year ago. That's going to be the interesting thing is whether you can you have the money. So the company, and that's why when I wrote, I, I put up my fifth viral update yesterday. And one of the things I think uh, I, I wrote was you have to think about the 2020 effect, but you also have to think about how is this crisis affected long term, uh, what the prospects are. So if you accept it, it's possible that this reinforces it. Unless you're a company which has a cash problem, where you're going to say, I wish we hadn't done that and kept the cash. This is playing out across, across the world. Companies are looking at big projects they took at the end of last year, early this year, and they're either regretting what they did, if they have a cash problem, or they're asking, should we have done that in the first place? But um, all I'm saying is this is going, I mean, this is going to have consequences, long-term consequences in terms of investments on it. So I'm going to you know, finish my discussion. Are there any questions about any of the things we talked about, especially on the incremental cash flow thing with the studio? Because the two things I want you to remember from this case, because let's face it, you'll forget the rest of it, unless, of course, every time you watch Netflix, the case pops into your mind, in which case I'm really, really sorry for having ruined your Netflix experience. I want you to think about these two things. One is the studio incremental effect, how we define incremental. Don't think like an accountant. Think in terms of cash flows to the company. And the second is that capital maintenance assumption, because that's something that will help you a lot when you start thinking about value in businesses, value in companies, because this is one of the places where I think analysts often are inconsistent. They change the growth rate without thinking about reinvestment. Any last questions about the case? Is it fair if you assume that after 10 years, in the 11th year, they want to build a new manufacturing facility? Yeah, if you want to do anything in year 11, you got to be careful because if you put it into your year 11 cash flows and make it your cash flow for terminal value, you're going to be building something new every year. So if you're going to do something after year 10, one technique, technique you can use is to convert that investment. Let's say it's once every 10 years, you now have to build a studio, which will cost you $2 billion. Convert the $2 billion into an annuity over 10 years and take that annuity out of it. It's like a sinking fund. You're going to have to set aside every year. So rather than put the total investment in year 11, put in an annuity to cover that investment because that way every 10 years you can keep reinvesting in a new studio it's already built into your cash flows so what we did was that we assumed that after so whatever you made in year 11 without depreciation like yeah. after adding back depreciation you just reinvest take 30 percent of it back that's not going to be enough right because then your depreciation is going to you'll have nothing left to depreciate any number below 100% after year 10, you're going to have a problem. Do you see why? No, I'm, I'm doing 30% on the free cash book that year. Every oh, year. free cash. Okay, you're reinvesting. Okay, that's, reinvest yeah, that's a lot to reinvest. What growth rate did you use after year 10? We use 1.5. You're probably reinvesting too much because... One way to think about how much you need to reinvest is your reinvest your growth rate divided by the return. What return on capital did you have for the project? The return on capital traditional was like around twenty to seventy. Okay, percent. let's make it twenty percent. One point five divided by twenty percent is roughly what you'd have to reinvest. So what, what does that work out to? Seven point five percent. So seven point five percent of your after tax operating income would would be what you need to reinvest to keep this project going. So that's a very, it's, as I said, I'm not going to hold you accountable on this project 
on doing this, but it's actually, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's basically the 1.5% growth rate divided by the return on capital. So it's, it's a quick and dirty way of estimating how much you need to reinvest. Okay. Hi, Professor. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Um, if, if we are supposed to not pay that much attention to accounting returns and focus on the cash flows and NPVs, why, why are we... Why do we do it? Because yeah. the market looks at accounting earnings, right? So even if you don't make decisions based on accounting returns, what do you report every quarter? You report earnings and you report earnings per share. So even companies where decisions are made on cash flows, they will spend time on the accounting numbers, not because they change your decision, but because they change your look to investors. And companies like Netflix are very concerned about how they will look to investors. They want to show revenue growth. They want to show profits. I, I you know. So. I, I agree with you. I made you pay attention to something that wasn't a big part of your decision making, but it's really to prepare you for the fact that even if you believe in NPV and IRR and do only free cash flows, the people above you will say, well, what will this do to my earnings? And there you'll be playing the allocation game, the capitalizing game. You'll be doing whatever you need to do to look good on an earnings basis. And, and similarly with ROIC as well, I guess. Right, by extension, yeah. yeah. Now, Eric assumes 100% retention for the more, oh, so yeah, I do assume 100%. So if you deviated from that, that's fine. Yeah, go ahead. Emily? Professor, yep. I have a quick question. Because for our team, we discussed like two renewal rates. Yeah. The first we assume it is by default 100%, which means 100% of the subscribers will stay yeah. um, with the network every year. And the second renewal rate we use is a percentage for the people who stay on the network um, over five years and will also be willing to purchase a new bike. So in this case, you only actually assume one. So just one bike for every subscriber. So you don't have a second bike bought after five years. Is that what the two different the difference between the two scenarios is? Yeah, according to the case for subscriber. Yeah, that's. I mean, yeah, yeah, because so do you end up with a much lower net present value then? You will have a higher net present value because the repurchase. They say no, no. I, that's what I'm. That's what I assumed for my cash flows. That's what a hundred percent renewal rate here means. Is at the end of year five, all those old subscribers you signed up in, in time zero are going to buy a new piece of equipment. Yeah, okay. That's what I assumed. Yeah. Any other questions? David, do you have a question? Tim, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to ask. Um, you had spoken about changing or converting the, uh, the Whippy CapEx in, in your 11 to an annuity to reflect mm -hmm. that. Um, is another option to assume that there's going to be a reinvestment CapEx in year yeah. 10? For for that future depreciation, that's what Arguably, that's it. Would, it wouldn't project it. It wouldn't project like the growth rate yeah. and the cost of that capex. But you know, if you were to net another two billion investment with your see, but you have to, yeah, you have to talk about the growth rate, right? Because that reinvestment assumption has to be tied to your growth assumption. So you can never talk about reinvestment without telling me why you're reinvesting. That's why if you're reinvesting something after year 10, it's got to be consistent with what you're assuming as growth beyond year 10. The two are not separate assumptions, they're linked assumptions. I'm completely flexible about how you link them, but they have to be linked. Yeah. Did you, um, how did you finance the project? Did you assume any debt and, and where would we sit on the cash flows? You wouldn't. Right. In fact, the the net of the cost of capital. What do we assume? We assume that this project will be funded the same way that Netflix was funded with about what nine, ten percent debt, ninety percent equity. Why isn't it showing up in my cash flows? Because obviously, debt has interest expenses, right? Why are there no yeah, interest? But, but but shouldn't that initial year zero capex be reduced by any borrowings? If you do that, what type of project? Remember, we did two kinds of project analysis. We did the Disney, Rio Disney, and we did Vale Iron Ore. And the difference was Rio Disney, I did it from the perspective of the entire firm. I looked at pre-debt cash flows and I discounted the cost of capital. 
Rio Disney I did from an equity investor's perspective where I looked at how much of the initial investment comes from equity and then I looked at cash flows after debt payments. Did you do an equity project analysis? Well, now I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, go back and check. You can do it with equity, but then you should be discounting at the cost of equity. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? David? Oh, David, was that your little question? Okay, never mind. Yeah, that was me. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to, as I said, I'll post this or a few typos there, especially 15 and 10 years. I have to fix it. I'm sorry. It was, it's a little sloppy, but I got done like six minutes before I was supposed to start the class. So it's, uh, so I'll fix those before I post it. So you're not looking, where did the 15 years come from? Okay. Let's go back to page 303. I want to talk a little bit more about no, we have, we have a little more time left. We have about 20 minutes left. I want to talk about side costs and side benefits. And I want to do that while the iron is hot because basically in this project, you've already talked about some of those issues. When you take a project, there are side costs and side benefits. And Disney is a perfect example of side benefits, right? When they provide a movie, they sell toys, there's a theme park uh, expansion. So. The side costs include costs you create for the company because you're using resources that the company already has. And the returns you have for a project should reflect these side costs and side benefits. That's a basic principle. So let's talk about the first type of side costs. It's called an opportunity cost. What's an opportunity cost? An opportunity cost arises any time you use a resource that already belongs to you as a company on a project. So let's say you own a vacant warehouse. You're starting a project, you use that warehouse. Or more specifically, in the case of Netflix, you have an existing studio. And that studio you're going to be using for the new project. When you use an existing resource, here's the one thing you cannot do. You cannot say, look, I already own it, therefore it's costless, I'm gonna attach no cost. Because there's always a cost to using a resource. That cost can either be that you can sell that resource. Maybe it's vacant land, so I can sell that land. Maybe you can rent or lease that, uh, that asset out, in which case your opportunity cost is the rental income you could have made from that. Or maybe by using this resource now, you're going to cost yourself more in the future, which is exactly what happened in the studio, right? By using 30% of the studio now, you didn't create a cost for the firm right now, but in your for because you took this you took netflix fit you have to invest in the studio what i'm asking you to do is think through the consequences of taking over something you own so let's take a very simple example remember the rio disney theme park <coughs> seems like a <coughs> lifetime ago but in that particular theme park let's assume that disney owns land in rio already this land is not developed it was acquired several years ago and the cost of acquiring the land was five minutes. You bought it cheap. If the theme park is built, this land is going to be used <clears throat> as the headquarters where you love the offices for your Disney. You can sell the land right now for 40 million. Okay? But if you do sell it, there's a capital gain issue and your capital gains will be taxed at 20%. So you're doing the Rio Disney analysis. You're using this land and you're saying, well, should I be attaching a cost to the land? So I'm going to give you the choices and you think through them and tell me which choice you would use in terms of attaching a cost to that land. The first is you can ignore the cost of the land with the argument that Disney already owns the land, therefore they don't need to spend the money. You can use the book value of the land, which is five million. You can use the market value of the land, saying that's what I can get if I sell the land. Or is there something I'm missing when I use the market value of the land? Maybe there's another answer. Anybody want to give me the opportunity cost of using this land? Rizwana, you said C. Okay, so I'm going to put you on the spot. Un unmute yourself because I'm going to lead you through. You yeah. So you said 40 million. Yeah, you're almost there. So by using the land, I'm losing 40 million. But think it through. Once I sell the land for 40 million, is there any other consequence I face because I've sold the land? So if you pay the tax, I guess you need 40 times 1 minus... Not quite 40. It's only the capital gain portion. What's the definition of capital gain? It's the difference between what you sold it for minus the book value. Your capital gain here is 35 million, right? Yes. 
20% of that is 7 million. You subtract the 7 million out because you got to pay the taxes. When you do opportunity cost, you got to carry it to its logical limit. That's why when I built the studio in year four, I said, I'm building the studio. I'm going to have to depreciate it. That's a loose end, but you got to tie up that loose end. So in the, in the Rio Disney theme park investment analysis, you'll see land opportunity costs minus 33 million, reflecting the fact that by taking the project, I've lost 33 million I could have made by not taking the project. Any questions? I would use the same principle if I'm borrowing employees, because remember when big companies take projects, they often borrow employees from other divisions because those employees are underutilized. You got to use the same principle and start thinking about what is the cost I'm creating to the company by doing this. And the cost is not just an accounting allocation, it's a cash flow effect you're thinking through. No questions? So let's talk about a second, a second example. Let's assume that Bookscape is planning to start an online book retail store. I mean, the, the details of this are going to be so dated, you're going to laugh. So they're going to start an online retail store. They need phone lines and computer equipment. And it's uh, that phone lines and computer equipment is going to cost them a million dollars, which they would depreciate to a zero savage value. The revenues from this online venture are going to be a million and a half in the first year, grow 20% in year two and 10% in years three and four. The cost of the books will be 60% of whatever your revenues are. If you start this online venture, the salaries and benefits of the employees in the venture are going to be 150,000 in year one and grow 10% for the next three years. Working capital, book retailers need to keep working capital, will be 10% of revenues and may be made at the beginning of each year. I forgot to mention this in my Netflix fit case, but if you look at my working capital investment, it starts in year zero. Why year zero? Because there's really no year zero, it's right now. That's the investment I had to make to cover my year one revenues. Year one will be to cover year two revenues. So the change in working capital is going to lead my revenue change by one year because I make my investment at the start of every year. So at the end of year four, I'm going to salvage my entire working capital, which is often the safest assumption to make. Tax rate is 40%. So that's my venture. Let's compute the cost of capital for this venture. So using the principle that we use for Netflix fit, I can't use Bookscape's beta and cost of equity because that's just a bookstore. I looked at the beta for online retailers. And that time, you know, in, 2000, in 2013, let's say that was three, very risky business. I, use, I assume that they would be the project to be funded with the same mix of debt and equity as Bookscape as a company, very similar to my Netflix assumption. And I ended up with a cost of capital using that unlevered bait of 3.02, a cost of capital of 18.12%, much higher than the cost of capital that I got for Bookscape as a company. Incidentally, I used a total beta. Why? Because remember, Bookscape is privately owned, so I'm staying close to the same principle. But the bottom line is the cost of capital I'm going to use to discount the cash flows on this book, on this online venture is much higher than my cost of capital for Bookscape as a company. I hate to keep you know, drumming home the same point, but the point I'm making is the cost of capital for a project should reflect the risk of the project. You saw that with the Rio Disney theme park, the Vale Iron Ore project, the Netflix fit case, and now with the Bookscape online. So if you look at the net present value of this investment based on those assumptions, it's a very simple investment. My revenue started 1.5 million, grow at 20% in year two, 10% thereafter. There's my employee expense, 150,000 growing at 10%. Material, 60% of revenues. Depreciation based on my $1 million initial investment. I compute my cash flows every year. I dis discount them back at that 18.12%. The net present value that I get for this investment is 76,300. So it's a pretty simple project, right? I said, but oops, I forgot something. And here's what I forgot. I forgot to tell you that this online venture is going to, cre is going to create more work for my existing manager. So he's already the general manager. I'm not hiring a new manager. He's going to have to work harder and I'm going to have to give him a pay raise. So this 20,000 increase that you see in pay is essentially because I started the online venture. Remember, incremental, because I took this project, I have to pay more. That extra 20,000 every year 
is an additional expense. After the online venture ends at the end of year four, the salary is going to drop back to 100,000. Don't even ask me how I'm going to explain the salary drop to him after year four. But the online venture means I have to pay him more. I also forgot to tell you that if Books, Bookscape Online is started, I need to get an additional storage space for financial records, and that'll cost me 10,000 a year. So I'm going to have 20,000 in additional salary next year, 10,000 storage costs. So here's what I did. I took my additional salary costs every year. But remember, salaries are tax deductible. When I pay 20,000 as additional salary, because my tax rate is 40%, my after-tax expense is only 12,000. I take the present value of my after-tax salary costs, it works out to 34,352. My additional storage cost every year, it's not 10,000, it's 1,000. It's 1,000 dollars, after-tax is 600, present value is 1,600. My true net present value, if I net these two opportunity costs, and they're really costs of resources that I that I create, is going to be lower, but it's still positive, 40,413. Incidentally, I kept my opportunity costs separate here and I computed the present value. I could have put them into my regular cash flows. So if I put them into my regular cash flows and take the present value, I would get exactly the same net present value. One of the nice things about present values, you can do them in pieces and add them up. That's why I could do the present value of the Netflix fit and the net present value of the synergy benefits and add them up. I can consolidate them and do a weighted average. If I do it right, I will get the same answer. So pres that's why you can do a sum of the parts valuation of a company. You can do it in pieces. It's one of the nice features of present value. Take advantage of it, especially if you have different cash flows with different restraints. Rizwana asked the question about where do I get the values? Which values, Rizwana? The, the 20,000 increase in, is the increase in salary to the managers. The 1,000 is the additional storage cost. So you know the, the table at the bottom, the opportunity oh, cost. All I did was I basically went into my cash flows two pages ago. So if you go back two pages and I put in the additional 10,000 into my expenses. It basically, I took this, so rather than, I'm sorry, the additional, remember I have 20,000 in additional salaries, put them into the labor cost, make it 170,000. In other words, you could do the whole cash flows with the additional expenses incorporated in them. And if you do that, you will get a new set of cash flows. So the 327,400 should be 340,000 minus 12,000 minus 600. Okay, so basically I'm just netting out the cost. Any other questions? Now look, I'm gonna do one final example and this should be kind of familiar. So in the Vali example, assume that the firm has a distribution system that it's built for its iron ore that it's gonna use for the new iron ore mine. The mine manager comes and says, look, there's no cost because we already own it. It cannot be sold or leased, you can take a look. There's no opportunity cost. I've kind of set up this question already. So basically what I'm saying is if I take an existing facility, which I'm underutilizing and I use it for a new project, given that I cannot sell the facility or lease it out, is there no opportunity cost? Hey, I can reframe this question. Netflix fit used an existing studio, right? They use 30% of the existing studio. Netflix can't sell the 60%, it can't lease the 60% at least given the case. So right now there's no cost, right? But is there a cost to the project eventually? Perry? Well, that depends if you think the firm can use it internally in the future. Then exactly, the cost. exactly. Okay. That's basically what, yeah, that's basically what you need to flesh out, right? You need to flesh out how much this capacity would grow anyway. You'd have to ask the same two questions we asked with Netflix Fit Studios. What will happen if I don't take this project? What will happen if I take this project? And look to see if it makes a difference. Maybe it will not. Maybe you have so much excess capacity that you will never use it. In which case, you can say the studio is free. But as long as there is another usage that's going to use it, there has to be a present value effect. Rukshan, you said there should be no opportunity cost. Was there an opportunity cost from the studio in um, the Netflix fit, even though there was no way to sell or lease the extra space? 
we were so, so my question is more let's say the studio was lying vacant there were no other projects then you can use zero you've set up the exact scenario that is the only case where you use zero is that 60 percent were not just unutilized but it's never going to be utilized and you wouldn't sort of say I mean, I guess if you were evaluating two projects, would you say, fine, it's not being used for anything we currently have underway, but if we're evaluating two, then the opportunity cost is using it for this project yeah, and the other project? No, because there's no opportunity cost. So this wouldn't even enter the decision then. Why, why tilt your decisions if it's never going to cost you? Uh, I'll go back and punish somebody for building such a big studio in the first place, but it's been done. It's a sunk cost. So I mean, that if let's say I have a studio and I have two, I could either use it for Netflix fit or another project. My opportunity it, cost would be that other project. There'll be zero. No, the opportunity cost of the studio will be zero for both. Do the net present value of both both projects and pick the one with the higher net present value. It will automatically take care of itself, right? Because then you're picking the project which utilizes the studio best. Your traditional NPV will give you that answer. Any other questions? So whenever you use excess capacity, you say, why don't you do this before the case? Because I have given away too much. Ask yourself two questions. If I do not take this project, what will happen to that capacity? If I do take this project, what will happen to the capacity? And then when you run out of capacity, ask the question, what am I going to do? Am I going to cut back on production? Because that's the other choice, right? When you run into a full you say, I'm not going to produce more or buy new capacity. In the Netflix fit case, I kind of preempted the first choice and said, you have to build a new studio. But the other choice is you're going to cut back on Asian content, which is going to cost you in terms of subscribers. So whenever you have excess capacity, you have to ask these follow-up questions. Any questions? So let's do one final opportunity cost example before we tie up this loose end. Let's assume in the Rio Disney theme park, 20% of the people who went to that theme park would have come to Disney anywhere. Remember, a lot of Brazilian tourists come to the Orlando theme park because it's actually getting from Sao Paulo to Orlando is easy, this direct flights. So let's say 20% of the revenues for the Rio Disney theme park would have come to Orlando anyway. Let's go back and revisit that calculation. In doing the analysis of the theme park, should I count only the incremental revenues, which will lower my revenues, perhaps make the theme park go from being a good project to a bad project? Look at total revenues, or should I pick some number in the middle? Anybody? Yeah. Go ahead, Perry. So I'll take the I would take the hundred percent amount and count it for the the rate of return for the Brazilian theme park, and then the twenty percent I will I will add back uh, at the rate for the U.S. theme park. Add back or subtract out? Because if you take the hundred, subtract, subtract out. Yeah. So basically, you're looking at incremental revenues. You're just doing it in a more finessed way. So you lower the revenues. That's what we learned from you. Yeah. That's a good point. You know, can you imagine working for Starbucks and this, you know, if you look at the, and I know we're not in New York, but if you were, if you were, you know, at least I'm not in New York, but if you're at NYU, think about the six Starbucks that are within three blocks in any direction. Can you imagine opening a new Starbucks? I would say 40% of your people who are coming to that Starbucks probably were going to that Starbucks three blocks away. Now you're just a little more convenient. If you opened only based on incremental revenues, you're going to be much more cautious about opening new projects. I agree with you on the Rio Disney theme park, but I'll tell you why I agree with you. That 20% have nowhere else to go, right? Basically, it's Disney or bus. Can you imagine going to your kid and saying, hey, hey, I told you I was going to take you to Disneyland, but you know what? Why don't we just go to Universal instead? It doesn't work that well. There are no easy substitutes. So when you're the dominant game in town, you should count only incremental revenues. So if you're a drug company and you've come up with a new drug to treat ulcers, but you own the dominant drug, then you might hold back on producing the new drug. I know it's a terrible thing to do, 
because you're looking at only the incremental revenues. But let me give you a different example and you tell me whether the answer might be different because I agree with you on the Rio Disney, you should count only the incremental revenues because you're going to say, look, I'm going to get the other 20% anyway. Why should I be counting it? But let's say you're producing a new show on Disney cable and that Disney cable show is going to suck up a lot of users who are going to ABC's cartoon shows, which is also owned by Disney. Should you then count only the incremental people or should you count total? And why would your answer be different? But let's do a what if. Let's say you count only the incremental people on this new show and you don't produce the show. What's your worst case scenario? You get cannibalization anyway, but the cannibalization goes to NBC or it goes to CBS. The lower the barriers to entry, the stronger competition becomes, the more you should start to push towards not you know, bringing in the 100% saying, I'm going to act like the entire revenue should go there. Because if you don't do that, here's what's going to happen. You're going to not produce these projects and your competitors are going to produce projects that essentially take, take do the cannibalization for you. It's better to cannibalize yourself. It's better not to have any cannibalization in the first place. But if you're going to have cannibalization, it's better to cannibalize yourself than have somebody else do it. So the bottom line is, if you have very strong competitive advantages, like Disney has in the theme park business, you should count only the incremental revenues. The weaker your competitive advantage is, the more inclined you have to be to count total revenues, even though some of those total revenues might be coming from your own products. That might explain why Starbucks does what it does. Their view is if we don't open a Starbucks, there's going to be a, you know, whoever the competitors, Costa Coffee, that's going to take our competition, uh, our, 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 our customers away because they're more convenient. The less competitive advantage you have, the more you worry about competitors, the more you have to think about total revenues and not just incremental. Let that kind of bounce around your head because at the start of next class, we will start by kind of with this slide. So if you have any questions that come out of this incremental versus total, that would be a good place to kind of bring it up and talk about it. But if there, are, I have nothing else to say. If there are any final questions, comments, you know, uh, Rami asks, is the opportunity cost of funding embedded in the cost of capital? Exactly. That's exactly what the cost of capital is. What can I make on this money if I invested elsewhere in a project with equivalent risk? What slides are included in the quiz? Um, I would say through to the end, before we started the side costs and side benefits, maybe 30 slides ago, I'll send you the precise slide. That, um, that we will end with. So it's going to be through the Vale Iron Ore project. So, and, and, and the first parts of what we did before today's session. So we'll, you know, pretty much everything to do with incremental cash flows. Um, because I have a question with regards to the excess capacity. Yeah. So at the current moment, if say for the, for the next one or two years, you know you have excess capacity. So there's zero cost. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that would imply zero opportunity. No, 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 no. Opportunity cost is the present value of your cost over time, not just what you have in year one. So it'll be a zero opportunity cost in year one, zero opportunity cost in year two, zero in year three, zero in year four, and then a hundred million in year five. But if you don't know for certainty as to what when, you don't, you don't know, you don't know for. Still account for it. You don't know for certainty whether your revenues next year will be your revenues. If you use that test, none of your numbers should show up on your spreadsheet. Which number do you know with certainty in the Netflix fit case? Certainty is not a word you can use when you're looking at risky projects. Everything is uncertain. Everything is estimated. When you ignore something, you are making an assumption as well. So this, this, this argument people use of, hey, I'm too uncertain about when the studio will be used, therefore I'm gonna use a zero cost. Is a zero cost making an assumption? Absolutely. So there is no way around it. You're making an assumption no matter what. Make your best assumptions. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so I'm gonna send you specifics about uh, the, the quiz. You know, Avesha has a question, is, it, is this quiz two going to cover the material covered in quiz one? Technically, no. 
it's only about capital budgeting but in capital budgeting what you need to discount your cash flows you need a cost of capital to get a cost of capital you need levered betas so if you're really shaky about quiz one material you might want to review it but if you know if you feel pretty comfortable then just start on slide 150 and go through 300 and whatever 303 three. basically go through the rest of packet one you know why why hold back because nothing we did today is that different from what we did before so basically go through the end of packet one let's do that that's i think the safest choice is just go through the end of you no know, or at least towards to the slide that i ended today that we're covering everything about present value think of say the second quiz as kind of a focused test on what you did in the case so if any of you kind of coasted on the case and let somebody else do the heavy lifting I would suggest that you look through your numbers and at least understand what you did as a group because that's critical and take a look at the slide at the, both the Excel spreadsheet and the presentation I'm going to put online in a few minutes and kind of go through them and if you have any questions about anything you've done now we're going to have off you know I'll have an additional office hour this weekend so basically I'll, I'll just you know, I think I don't know I haven't decided Saturday or Sunday but maybe Sunday I will have an extra hour and um, you know if you have any questions relating to anything to do with quiz 2 yeah, you can come back that's it any other questions uh, when you say end of packet 1 is it the no, but not, what, not end of packet 1 what slide are we on I can't even read the number at the bottom it's what 314 so let's make it 314 Okay. Really, I mean, there's nothing we've done today that is that different. We've just applied present value in a special context because everything we've talked about today, we talked about in the, in the case and the studio. So just, just do it through 314. I think it's the safest thing to do. Okay, I'm going to stop the session and I promise you the slides and the Excel spreadsheet will be on really soon. Take care and have a good day.